Welcome back to the Grand Solar Minimum channel. Today is April 6th, 2018. Happy Friday. Got through another week. It's been a crazy one. Let's go ahead and take a look at our solar wind conditions right now. If I can get my cursor to work. Here we go. All right. Take a look at our stats for the day. Our solar wind speeds are currently sitting at 352.8 kilometers per second with a density of 5.3. Zero sunspots to report once again, five days in a row, making it now 57 days without sunspots in 2018. We're almost at 60% of the year so far without sunspots. Take a look at our KP indices. We're sitting at a two with a 24 hour max at two as well. And looking at our SDO, they're monitoring this coronal hole that we should feel the effects for this on April 9th through the 10th. Now, um, nothing significant is being forecasted other than a minor G1 possible. But here we watch at the last minute this coronal hole developing sort of an edge here in the center. So keep an eye on that. That is now earth facing. This coronal hole stretches back like last time, but this one is not as big as it originally was back at the beginning of March, or I should say the, the mid part of March. Take a look at our TSI. We finally got some updated information. As of March 30th, our TSI seems to be taking a bit of a dive. Nothing too serious, but we are sitting at 1360.5591, I believe, right now. So this is the first time that we've seen the values go below 0.6 in a while. A very slow progress indeed, but uh, just wanted to show everyone that we are seeing a pattern here, uh, a steep decline. A little bit of recovery and then another sort of steep decline, not as steep as it was back on the 17th of March. However, um, it'll be curious to see where this levels out if this just continues to fall out. Let's go take a look at the watchers real quick. We got snow depths in the Swiss Alps past seven meters. In Switzerland, which reported a snow depth somewhere above 20 feet in March reported 4.75 feet of snowfall at the end of March and early April and now <clears throat> and now record it upper slope the upper slope base is going to be about 24.27 feet. Um, I do believe that this is just part of some of the information we're getting out of there. I've seen totals as high as 36 feet some of the reports coming in from this area a snow depth of 17 feet has been reported at Alvarez at the French Alps too. the first five meter plus uh, snow base in many years due to the high amounts of snow less arc ski resorts have, start, have stated it will open its glacier for the summer skiing so they've had a really good skiing season this year, and it's going to continue through. Oh, we don't want to see that. Thanks, watchers. <laughs> and let's go back. There's a couple stories I wanted to touch base with. Uh, Cinnabon, once again, erupts. Major eruption took place at Mount Cinnabon around 9 UTC, April 6th, shooting ash about 50,000 feet above sea level. The aviation code was raised to 11. This is the second major eruption on this volcano in two months and apparently there was two plumes that this threw off the first one was around 50,000 feet and the second explosion was somewhere right around uh, 15 to 20,000 feet so once again eyes are on Mount Cinnabon Mari will probably do a little fact finding on this this weekend and see what information she can pull up she's been following this particular region very closely uh, pretty much all year long, especially as active as Cinnabon has been here as of late. Uh, Mari shared some interesting stats with me about Cinnabon. It started going off in uh, 2010. Was the first known eruption? It was the first. In 1,200 years? It was a small eruption, and it was the first in 1,200 years. Okay. Yeah. And we've seen eruptions in 2010, 2014, and now 2018. So it seems to be showing a four-year pattern. 55,000 feet is pretty high up. We'll have to fact check this for sure. 
Yeah, it says it took place in August, lasted about a month, and had a volcanic explosive index of two. Uh, looks like in 13 we had another one. Seven, yep, yeah, September 17, 2013, and then uh, May of 2016, and then this year. Mount Cinnabung did claim the lives of 23 people in 2016. So, But again, thanks to the watchers. They have done excellent work on covering these volcanoes and these major earthquakes. Again, I have a lot of sources that we go through to uh, get to these um, certain stories. And the watchers does a really good job at covering things that aren't uh, found on other sites. Here's a very interesting article. Thank you again, Mari. Uh, I featured a story written by this gentleman. Um, his name is Simon Constable. And he did a story for Forbes. And I, I made a pretty big deal about it because he was featuring a, a solar physicist book. I want to read this off to you guys really quick. The price of corn could soar is to $8 a bushel, a level not seen since 2012. And more than double last Thursday's closing price of three eighty nine. An unusual confluence of factors could propel prices higher over the next couple of years. These include declining output and an ethanol-led demand surge in China, and likely the brutal weather. And I like how they put at the end, this is going to be due to declining output and ethanol-led demand surge in China, and then last but not least, likely brutal weather. Uh, $8 is very possible, says Sean Hackett of the Hackett Money Flow Report newsletter, who adds that declining supplies will run headlong into increased Chinese demand. Now, something else I want to mention here as well. Uh, it's been stated that there is a forecasted drought for 2019 in China, and that makes people a little bit nervous as well. Also, this correlates with an article that the watchers put up on their website not too long ago how the chinese were messing around with some geoengineering to bring more rain to the region so i think these folks are getting ready for what they know is coming uh, obviously but all kinds of information how much corn will be needed a lot the u.s has fewer registered vehicles than china 268 million versus 300 million and they're talking about the ethanol uh, use here the ethanol use, uh, demand in corn is going to rise because of this. China has decided that gasoline in China should include 10% ethanol by 2020. That's just two years away. So the E10 policy is going to be in full effect out there in China. So they're going to have a huge demand in corn. Now, the 2017-2018, the corn projected total is 216 metric tons. That is down from 225 million tons in 2015 and 16. So we're about 9 million tons short this season. Combine that with the United States. Their totals came in at 371 million tons, and that's down from 385. So a little bit more of a loss in the United States than China and you figure China's getting ready to go into this new ethanol uh, kick with their fuel over there. So, But what I really found interesting about this article, not just the use of all the corn, but here's where it gets interesting. To cap it off, unfavorable growing weather forecast is being forecasted because the sun has entered a trough in its unusual 11-year cycle. The number of sunspots on a solar surface varies over that period. When fewer or no sunspots are present, the Earth's temperature tends to be lower than when we were with more spots. And he kind of went over this as well in his article with, in the Forbes magazine. Now, here's where he uh, highlights this. Sometimes the cycle morphs into a grand solar minimum, such as happened from 1645 to 1715, when Europe experienced a mini ice age. The concern now is that we may have a repeat situation with years of tough growing conditions. And then here is the uh, solar physicist that he used. He promoted his book. He says the next solar cycle is likely quite to be quite weak. Um, he goes on to say, will it be a grand minimum? It's difficult to make a definitive prediction, but it is a possibility. And certainly a grand minimum will have a cooling effect. But he also wants to let everyone, in. he is a cautious scientist. You know, he's trying to say this in the most tippy toe way. But thank you, Mari, for finding this article. As once again, this writer here, 
Uh, this is a very respected um, news organization. It's one of these papers you have to subscribe to to get the details and all that stuff. So he's written for Forbes and now Barron's, and both times he is really trying to highlight the effects of the grand solar minimum already. And it, like I said, and we've said this many times, it's just the beginning. Crop insecurity, what is the future of our food? And I'm not going to get into a whole lot about this, but I'll read some of this here because there's a lot of interesting points it brings up. The so-called Green Revolution of the 1960s was a pivotal movement for agriculture. Decades of investment in agric agricultural research, much of it supported by the U.S. government, resulted in new, higher-yielding crops that were introduced to developing countries along uh, fertilizers, agrochemicals, and irrigation techniques. It goes on to talk about more of uh, techniques of crop growing and how it's revolutionized over the years. Um, I want to get to the part where we were looking at um, the decline in diversity of our food system is recent and risky and has preoccupied me throughout my career. Back in the 1980s during my postgraduate research in Nigeria, West Africa, I noticed that local farmers grew many more crops than, than those promoted by government advisory service um just a good read also talks about how moringa is a, a, an essential crop to grow mara you you read this one entirely didn't you i did and what did it say about or do, i'm sorry for putting you on the spot here yeah, that's okay. I'm what what it. do you remember it was talking about you you mentioned something to me about um well, this basically goes into how we have sort of relied on a certain four types of crops and how just due to the environment and how things are processed we need to shift in how we manage our food supply to be more resourceful more economical and it's talking about um having I, to me it seems like coming up with crops that are more jam-packed with nutrients to feed the amount of people we're going to need to feed, you know, over the next three decades. And it mentions that moringa is highly beneficial and uh, jam-packed with nutrients and all that. So I just thought it was an interesting article, and I shared it on Twitter and Facebook, and I am including it in the description uh, below. Uh, apparently, I, I'm a little confused in the chat about the uh, volcano. They're saying it went off, it was 16 K uh, instead of 15k so we'll have to verify that i know the article on watchers that he was reading is saying the ash went up to 15 kilometers 15 kilometers which is okay so it was 50 feet, so. it was fifty thousand feet my I, I misspoke it was Rob i said is saying it actually went up to 16 kilometers so the the article might be outdated i don't know could I be we'll do a follow-up tomorrow on that the second eruption was twenty four thousand feet i do know that so all righty. Um, thank you very much, Mari, for helping that. And I want to go to a few more weather headlines before we get into our quick look at our weather. Um, here we go once again. More winter weather. But this is the good news. Actually, where's the New Jersey one? This was, uh, this was encouraging. Here's the weather update for New Jersey. Snow remains in the latest fo forecast, but it won't be as much. I don't know if you guys are looking at this, but... Uh, we were trying to determine what kind of snowfall we were going to get for the D.C. area for the uh, peak for the snow blossoms. And that line is now looks like it's going to be um, diminishing. Threat of accumulating snow has diminished considerably for New Jersey. And now only a dusting is likely early Saturday across New Jersey as the system is expected to stay well south. At one point Friday forecasters were discussing the possibility of a few inches of snow falling across parts of New Jersey. And it's updates Friday morning. The National Weather Service says less than an inch will fall statewide. That was the same forecast that we got the day before today in Buffalo, where we were uh, forecast to get two to four inches, and then they came back and said a dusting, and we ended up getting about two inches a day before it melted within about two hours. But good news, that system that we were all watching for the weekend uh, for Saturday and Sunday has weakened quite a bit as they are not expecting the snowfall that they were once expecting uh, here is today's expected weather that the mix was definitely here in western New York Like I said that rain came in and kind of melted everything quickly and this just kind of shows us our weekend weather pattern 
Uh, and also, I want to talk about the West Coast as well. Before I get into the weather, though, a couple more stories that I wanted to bring up. I am a Royals fan, so today I was going through my articles and I found this. We are week into the regular season and the Royals have already played two games. I'm sorry, have only had two games postponed due to inclement weather, namely bitterly cold temperatures and snow. Of the four games they have played, all had an official game time temperature of 45 degrees or less, including a game played just above the freezing mark in Detroit. This weekend, their games for the Cleveland Indians calls for forecast in the 30s. In a new labor deal, the players' union successfully bargained for an extra four off days as a break from the daily grind. Baseball is reluctant to extend the postseason well into November since inclement weather for those games would be bad television partners. So to accommodate the four extra off days, the season began early on March 29th this year. However, it's given us a week full of games played in weather not fit for man or beast. It's, it is not just the Royals already. A total of eight games have been postponed in the first week of the Major League Baseball season, including four home openers. Of the games played, 24 of them, 13.7% of the games played as of Thursday, have been played in temperatures of 45 degrees or less. Almost 20%, guys, including the Pirates and Twins who played in the snow in Pittsburgh. Should baseball do anything about these chilly spring temps? Yes. Uh, These players, I'd say this is a bad time for baseball players to get out there and uh, do some damage to some muscles. And here we go. We got some temperatures. Just to give you an idea. Atlanta today, you were 55. Arizona's indoors. Baltimore, 52. Houston indoors. LA, 60. Uh, so that's a cool 62. Miami, that's a sweet spot. 76 degrees. Oakland, 55. Thank God Milwaukee's indoor. Texas, 61. Not bad weather here, but here's the cold weather. Boston's 43. Chicago Cubs, you're 44 with the White Sox. The Reds, 49 degrees is what they played in today. Cleveland Indians and Royals played in 42-degree weather today. The Rockies, 43 degrees, 42 in Detroit. Of course, Kansas City's in below 50, but they're in uh, Cleveland this weekend. The Yankees, 47. The Mets, 46. You see where I'm going with this, guys. Um, it's almost 50-50 right now with the Major League Baseball with temperatures settling at 48 or below. Um, I want to bring another one more point here as well. Uh, with that being said, what? Well, I had an article for uh, for the Indians Royals game this weekend. Instead, we got a uh, an advertisement about uh, prostate care. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it, it wasn't. Do you the want po- me to fix that no, for you, don't worry about it. But my point was, I already I already <laughs> talked about what I wanted to talk about. But hey, you know, live shows, I love it. But no, the, the, I was going to say that so far, <laughs> as and so far in April, we've had fifty two. Uh, high temperature records broken to, I'm sorry, it was 54 or 55 that were broken that were high temps. 102 cold record temperatures have been broken. So right now, cold to hot is 2 to 1 just in the first six days of April. That's pretty impressive. Now, not surprising because we still are on the edge of winter, but still a pretty impressive start to April to be so chilly everywhere. And we'll take a quick look at our weather. Our tropical tidbits is showing the South Texas, uh, Louisiana, Mississippi. We're going to keep our eyes on you guys tonight. We've had tornado watches. We've had radar uh, tornadoes show up, hail falling everywhere. Uh, So once again, inclement weather in the South, hail, uh, inch size hail is expected throughout the South. Tornado watches all the way to Georgia through tonight. And then we go further up northern in the plains. We got South Dakota and Wyoming and parts of Colorado. Uh, you're seeing some light snow. That atmospheric river is still hanging on, of course, out there in California. And as we move through Saturday, uh, northwest California, you guys are still getting drenched. Some light snow to move across the Ohio Valley, but mainly rain across the south and the east. And as we move out of the weekend, that little bit of snow that we thought we were going to get the six to eight inches in D.C., that's looking more and more like maybe possible three to five inches, not no six to eighteen This storm moves off to the Atlantic. Now, here's something interesting. This storm has shift slightly, but have no fear, folks. The way the high-pressure system is set up right now, 
that thing will continue to go off to the Atlantic Ocean. So it did shift a little bit, but again, we just don't have the right ingredients in place for this to be nor'easter number five in the last five weeks. So that's a bit of good news. I know up here in the Northeast, we're about tired of this coastal flooding and snow on top of it. Looking at Monday, start off the week a little quiet, some snow, light snow falling across the Midwest, some showers develop in the Gulf Coast areas. They move through pretty quickly uh, with midweek starting off with really nothing but some spotty showers up in Idaho, Utah, and Wyoming, and Montana. And other than that, we have a quiet day on hand for us on Wednesday, April 11th. Circle that day, folks. And that doesn't last too long as the Northwest, once again, sees its typical moisture this time of the year. So typical springtime pattern, it looks like, is starting to set up here after the 12th and 13th. Still got some snow in the higher elevations, and it looks like one more snowstorm to push out by the end of the month or mid-month on the 15th. But that's going to stay in the northern tier and into Canada. Now, the GFS is fighting another model here that's showing some possibilities of snow showers in western New York. And this is actually brand new information uh, updated by GFS. Earlier today, they were not showing this much snowfall. So I stand corrected. Uh, we now look at snow chances all the way through April 21st now. And a good amount. According to this GFS here, this cold front is sagging down on the 22nd. We're looking at colder temperatures all the way down in uh, Alabama, northern Alabama. Let's get a better look at this. I guess when you say colder, the 40s is a little bit colder, but nothing below freezing. It doesn't look like here for the east and the southeast. Not as warm as what we were actually hoping for after last night's update, but still. Not much longer, folks. There's still light at the end of the tunnel. And I'm looking forward to the, looks like the 14th of, actually the Friday the 13th is when we might see our first big blast of warm air here in the Midwest and the Northeast. Most of the country will finally start to feel like spring. Hopefully this winter snow goes away. But the one thing I want to point out about this snow is that it stuck around for a little bit. It snowed really good a couple hours this morning. But because of the angle of the sun, and where everything is right now um this snow won't stick along very well and uh, stick or stick around very long i should say and had the sun popped out at all today that snow would have been melted in 20 minutes so the good news is yeah we're still looking at snowfall possibility on our maps and especially in, in the next 10 to 15 days but like i said the good news is the temperatures are getting warmer and this snow is not going to be able to handle sticking around when it comes to getting later into the month of April. But still, impressive value so far, guys. When it comes to cold weather in April, who would have thought that the majority of the United States would be looking at 104 cold records broken within the first six days of April? I mean, that to me, that should have been the headline for tonight. And that should have stole everything besides the, uh, the prostate health exam and i can only imagine i can only imagine <laughs> I'm not even gonna repeat uh, that's some good i'm sure this is a family show or so let's <laughs> if you guys want to know what the racy stuff is just join us here on youtube in the chat we have a wild bunch here apparently <laughs> that's going to do it for us tonight guys i appreciate everybody tuning in want to say hello to regionxradio.com out there thanks for tuning in as well guys please make sure to like and share and we will have the day off tomorrow from an update for tomorrow. But we'll be back on Sunday. And if there's any breaking news, I'm sure Mario will come through with anything that's important with updates tomorrow to keep you guys informed. All right. We'll talk soon.